Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irene. I'm the host here, and my guest today is Bernd Kessler. Hi, Bernd. Hello, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I loved having you on my show. Thanks for having me. So I, I stumbled on your Instagram account. Actually, that sweater was the one that caught my attention first. Oh, really? Me. Oh, good. <laughs> Tell me a little bit how you go from living in Germany, studying landscaping, agriculture, <laughs> and becoming knitwear designer. Like what was uh, like two decades in one <laughs> paragraph? <laughs> well, I've been knitting since I'm a little boy. And it started actually when um, my sister, she used to make me really nice sweaters, <clears throat> but then she's two years older. She had her first boyfriend. So all the sweaters went to the boyfriend. And I was left there without my knitted sweaters. So it took much longer. And I thought, okay, I don't want to wait any longer. I want to do it myself. <clears throat> so I started knitting. And since I was little, I always really fell in love with knitting and I kept on doing it. But I never really knew how to use that as making it my work. So first I thought, okay, what can I do? I became a landscape gardener in Germany, which was a lot of fun. And then I went to live in England because I have some relatives living in England and the English gardens are really beautiful. So I lived there for a year and then came back to Germany and I studied in Germany horticulture. So I'm actually a horticulture engineer. And landscaping is very helpful too, even for knitting. So <clears throat> while I was studying horticulture, one of my teachers, he had his own company for doing seminars. And I worked there as a part-time job, helping him to create seminars. And during that time, the Japanese economy was really booming. It was this bubble economy in Japan. And all the German companies wanted to know, how do they do that? So the company was asked to make seminars about Japan. And this is how I get, got in contact with Japan. And I fell in love with Japan and the language and the culture and everything around it. So after graduating from my landscape, I went to another university and studied about Japan for another two years. And then looked up, uh, found my first job here in Japan and then came here and stayed. That's 24 so how, years now. How is Japan treating outsiders? Like, did you feel like you belong? Did you feel like you were between the chairs culture-wise? Like, is it difficult to be an immigrant to Japan? I think it really depends what, what you're looking for and uh, what you want to do here in Japan. Some people, they, they come here for a few years and then they leave. Japan is... Um, if you like it, you really like it. If you don't like it, you really don't like it. It can be very difficult. If you don't, if you don't like it here, then Japan is a little bit too extreme to, uh, if you don't like it, to live here. Fortunately, I, I really enjoy it. I live a little bit in between the cultures. You know, I live more like in a gray zone. And so far, to be honest, Japan has been really nice to me. I very much enjoy living here. It's a, it's a pleasure every day. And I'm happy that I can give back some of, uh, from my own culture, like knitting to the people around me. But it's a very, very nice country, I must say. People are very friendly. Uh, the culture is very interesting. They have tremendous gifted people here. The craftsmen here in Japan are just amazing what they what they sometimes do i'm honestly i'm always amazed when i when i see someone i was watching a program today and they showed someone who is specialized on repairing antiques it's absolutely mind-blowing what they do well so I, when i'm thinking of japanese knitting i'm thinking yeah. of that japanese stitch bible and the most impossible cables and the most impossible lace do you find like that to be the truth? Like, do you find that Japanese knitters take it to the next level? Does that inspire you? Do you try to counterbalance it with simpler designs? Um, Japanese knitting is not very old historically. It came through the merchants about 150 years ago, maybe. 
And so they don't really have a long history. Some Japanese, when they really get into something, they really get into it. Right. Honestly, they, they really master it. They had one lady, she really wanted to know the German lace knitting and she went all the way to Germany to study that and to learn that. Or I found another lady, she is specialized on this indigo dyeing. She went to Germany because there's a very old way of doing indigo dye and she wanted to know that. So some of them, they do that. Um, knitting right now is still popular, but probably not as much as before because there are just so many other, other things young people can do. Right. Um, when I make books, we usually have to, to sell them. Well, it usually has to be on a not too difficult level. Um, that's also because the, the charts in Japan need to be very detailed and some of the lace knitting patterns are quite then complicated to explain in a Japanese uh, manner, but uh, they're really good. I mean, they really enjoy that they, they take on a pattern and then they change it and they make it their own and they, they really figure out all the details. Very nice. I mean, I, I'm always impressed what they do here. Well, what caught my attention about you is that you get interested in something and oh. boom, you get a degree in it. <laughs> <laughs> what about knitting? Like, how was that process for you? Like when you decided that you want to write your first pattern, for instance, like how did you approach learning how to write a pattern? Well, pattern writing here in Japan is pretty much standardized. There is the... Japan Industrial Code, uh, JIS, uh, the JIS code, which also includes knitting symbols. So all patterns in Japan are actually written how you see them from the front and charted and quite big charts. Japanese knitters really want to have a lot of information for that, which makes it opposite way very good because if you're and non-Japanese, you can still use Japanese knitting books because they're so detailed that you can read them. And actually, I never really studied how to create patterns, but when I started my first knitting class and I had some patterns I wanted to show them, I couldn't use anything written. I needed to make a chart. So I really had to figure that out by myself. And now I'm, I'm actually quite good at that. I'm using very simple, uh, methods. I use a spreadsheet and make my charts and then I can turn them into, into files and print them out. So, but they have to be very detailed. Well, Even so a lot books. of people, a lot of people like wonder if it's possible to make a living being a knitwear designer. Like, is it difficult for you? Was it difficult for you to, from get go, like, especially as an engineer, right? When you have a job that pays you you go there like nine to five and you know that you always have an income. Was it a difficult decision for you to jump into something unpredictable as, as knitwear design? When, when I was already small, I always thought I want to make knitting my work. And I was doing different jobs here in Japan. When you come to Japan, usually, first of all, you need a visa, of course, and the visa is usually linked to the kind of work you can do. So changing jobs also means you have to do some legal processes. Um, after 10 years, I actually got a green card here in Japan. So now I'm also legally allowed to do pretty much anything I, I want to do. And I did various jobs, usually sales jobs and worked in recruitment or uh, company consulting. But after some time I thought, mm, it's not really so much fulfilling. Why do I do that in Japan? What can I do? And I remembered actually, I always wanted to do something with knitting. I always loved it. And one of my friends, he is, already pretty old, he's an 85 um, gentleman, he's a carpenter. And he did the same. He loved working with wood and he just went through and through all the obstacles and made himself into a carpenter. And he, he still works as a carpenter or my Aikido teacher also, he did the same. He loved Aikido and I thought, 
if they can do that, why shouldn't I be able to do that? And one day I just thought, okay, this is it. I don't want to, to continue working employed anymore. So I left and I had the summer with pretty much no work. And I thought, okay, what can I do? And I thought, okay, now I'm trying to work from knitting to make a living just out of knitting. And there are different ways how you can do that, of course. I mean, selling items is probably pretty difficult because the pricing is just uh, too high. But what I did here in Japan, you have something you call a culture school. And I was taking Aikido lessons at one of the culture schools. So I talked to the owner and said, how about we're making a knitting class? So we started making a knitting class. And then I went to another culture school and said, how about a knitting class? And we did a knitting class. And I had some other little side jobs and I had some savings and I actually thought, okay, I'll try for two years. And then after two years, I kind of could start to live from knitting. I still needed some side jobs, but now actually I just live from knitting. But it's not just designing stuff. I mean, I published books. So far I published 10 books and it really started to take off from me after I published my first book. Tell me more about the first book. Like, how did that happen? That was actually, it was a, a very cute uh, story. We, I don't know if you remember, there was this very strong earthquake here in Japan. Right. And uh, Tohoku was pretty much destroyed the coastline. And I started a little campaign to collect knit items. And then we started out and say, okay, let's make the world's largest blanket. And with a lot of help from people around the world and in Japan, we actually managed and we got a Guinness entry for that. And one of my students at my first knitting class, she is an illustrator for books. And she said, ah, how about we make a book out of this story with the Guinness record? And I said, okay, if you think so, but I don't think any publisher would be interested in that. But she went around to various publishers and they all said, yeah, not really what we want to publish, but one lady from a, a publishing company here in Japan, she kind of thought, what is this guy doing there? A man from Germany, knitting, riding motorbikes. Hmm, interesting, let's, let's check him out. And she then was my first editor and we made uh, three, four, five books together. And that, that's actually, and that's how actually things started here. If I can show it, my first book, it's in Japanese, but it's translated into German. It was about spiral socks. Huh. So what huh? else, what else, uh, what other kind of books did you write? Uh, we have spiral socks. Uh, I have a hat book. I have, I invented a really cool glove. And it's knitted from top down. And the book has been translated into German and it's so popular in Germany. I was so surprised. It was really a fun thing I thought about in an, uh, on a trip on an airplane and I knitted it. And it, this is the German version, spiral socks. Oh, here, 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 that's, that's the Japanese version. And it, it's really just knitted from top down and you can knit it in one. And that's what I like. I really don't like to cut yarn. I like to knit everything in one go. So we made a love book. We made a hat book. We made a, this is short row knitting. Then I made, oh, I had a book on Möbius. I love Möbius. And I invented my own idea for making Möbius. I have a brioche book. Möbius book was translated in Chinese. Sox book was translated into Korean. And my latest book is a book that just came out in Germany. And it's all about knit and pearl. And that was published with a German publisher in Germany. And is, is of course, only available in German right now. And all the other books are <laughs> available in Japanese right now. Right. And number 11 is on the way, and number 12 we're also thinking about right now. That's so awesome. I, well, I enjoy making books. I mean, here in Japan, the publishing industry is still very strong. And uh, it is 
something people enjoy when they get a book and they can see beautiful pictures and, and it gives the whole thing a lot of value. I don't publish uh, online patterns. Uh, I'm, I'm not on Ravelry, nothing. Uh, so if people try to find me there, sorry, I'm not there. <laughs> have you ever knitted a sweater for your sister? Oh, I haven't. <laughs> but she got a very nice shawl from me. She got a really nice shawl from me. I should do that. But she's very good in sewing, to be honest. And she sews a lot of her clothes and clothes for, for her kids. But I never, that's true, I never knitted... I hardly knit for other people, but she had a, I gave her a really nice big shawl from one of my books. She got that. So I <laughs> hope she's happy. If she sees that, if you want a sweater, of course I can knit your sweater. It's no problem. <laughs> well, is that boyfriend still a part of her life? No, he's not. Um, that the, have you heard of the boyfriend curse? No. There is, this, uh, there is this uh, theory that if you need a sweater to your boyfriend, it never converts him into a husband. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that <laughs> but they're still in contact. Uh, they, they live very close, but I, uh, he, he, he's a very nice guy. Tell me about the indigo dyeing. Tell me about the sweater that you're wearing. Yeah, indigo dyeing is, has a very long history here in Japan. It's all done with a plant. And it's then composted, and from the compost you make indigo. And I, I, I know indigo for a long time when I came to Japan. It has a very long tradition, and it makes a very unique blue. There is no way you can uh, copy that with uh, with chemicals. And the indigo dye is, I don't know if other plant dye will do that, but indigo will really chemically connect to the fiber. I've put this in the, in the washing machine and it does not lose the color. Yeah. And unfortunately here in Japan, because it's very labor intensive to produce this indigo, not a, many young people actually want to continue that kind of business. And it is used in Japan for shibori, you know, when they squeeze together the fabric and then they use indigo and they make this absolutely fantastic patterns and when I saw that I thought how could I maybe do the, something like this with knitting and of course I could knit a white sweater and then dye that I've done that too uh, but I can also dye yarn and then knit it which is probably the the common way anybody would do that so I've been making various indigo yarns for myself and I sold a little bit and then the other day, I, I started to experiment a little bit in making interesting yarns that create a, a unique pattern. When you use a, a regular skein, right. you always have the same kind of repeat. But there are different ways how you can wind up the yarn. And that will produce a very unique pattern when you knit it. And that's something I very much enjoy. So. For me, everything is kind of connected, the, the color, the yarn, the pattern, the way of knitting. And I, I'm trying to create very unique patterns with the yarn. And indigo is fantastic. It really dies. I mean, you, you must wear gloves. It, it's very, very strong. And the color is absolutely stunning. Can you show and, again your sleeves? The, yeah, sure. the patterns that you achieve. It, it makes this, hang on, I need to. Yeah, it's know, almost like a zebra or like the- Yeah, yeah, it, it makes this time. very unique, like an orbit. I had a similar, I, I just knitted a similar with, with a different yarn, but it also makes this orbit in the sleeve. So you and achieve that by dyeing yarn certain like, winding yarn certain way basically and then dyeing it yeah with with this yarn i i did it then really depends how many stitches you you probably use i don't know if there's any way you can really uh do that Th this is really by chance right yeah i hadn't planned it that way i knew it would happen somehow but i can't predict it 
So even with, with the other sweater, I can't plan it. And, uh, you know, this is when I knit, this is just regular. But uh, here on the sleeves, because the amount of uh, stitches are different, it started to make this little orbits. Right. And uh, I find it very charming. It's very nice. It's a surprise. I, I like that. I like things that surprise me knitting. You know, so is, you... is knitting for you a craft or art? Like, how do you see it? Uh, it's probably something I, I'm, I don't know if I'm an artist. Uh, knitting is more like, I, I'm not so in, interested in really having a piece. Of course, it's nice to have it. I enjoy the process, the technique to, to create something new. That's why I don't really like to knit the same piece twice. I, I like to make something different, something uh, original. And I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think I have, maybe I have one or two pieces you could call art, but um, it's a craft. It's a process. I'm still kind of an engineer somehow. I like to produce something, to create something, to find new ways and to, to solve problems. So, well, I mean, are you still a landscaper as well? Like, how does not that at all. bring? <laughs> not at all. I, I, I never. I, I worked as a landscaper, of course, and when I have to do repair here at my own place, I can do that. Uh, I, I fixed my parking for my motorbike, and I mix concrete when I have to, so I, I can do a lot of DIY, which is helpful, of course, and. I have a very good home center close by, which I enjoy very much. And I make my own tools sometimes or little machines or whatever I need for myself, which is helpful. But I, I really just work in knitting, nothing else. So, so talking about that motorbike, yeah. how much <laughs> do you do of that? Like how much time do you spend riding around? And does your Not knitting a... come with you all the time? Like is there yeah, anything on the bike? <laughs> Yeah, not while I'm riding. I mean, I need both my hands to ride, <laughs> but I always carry something with me wherever I go. And Japan is a absolute fantastic country for motorbike riding. The government spends a lot of money on building roads, maintaining roads. They have awesome tunnels here in Japan <laughs> with no cars. I mean, they spend lots of money here and the roads are in perfect conditions even the smallest roads you can think of so for bike riding it's beautiful and while I was in Germany I never took the license but when I came to Japan I thought mm, I would like to see a little bit more of the countryside but a car is quite expensive because I was really living in Tokyo I was living when you when you see a movie in Tokyo with all these neon lights I was living there <laughs> because my first company, they had a small apartment they gave me. So I was really living right in Shinjuku. This big crossing you see on TV is like three stops by train away. That's where I was living. And a car park would cost you the same as an apartment probably. So I couldn't afford it. But I took a motorbike license here, which was fun. And then I bought my first motorbike and I did a lot of touring. I think I've done like 160,000 kilometers by now in Japan. And whenever the weather is nice, I try to go out. And luckily now I live a little bit further away, not in Tokyo anymore, I live in Gifu, which is kind of, uh, how can I explain that? Gifu, nobody really knows where Gifu is. It's quite a large city. It's not too far from Osaka and Kyoto. It's about an hour and a half by high-speed train from Tokyo. And the nice thing is I just need to cross a river and I'm right in the middle of the countryside with beautiful mountains and the landscape is breathtaking here with cherry trees and the ocean is two hours away. I have the most beautiful ocean. And of course I take some knitting with me. How do and people look at you when you, I mean, here is this tough biker who pulls out his knitting out of his bag and starts of knitting course. like, do you get glances? Of course, all <laughs> the time. 
all the time. Not only on my bike, but even when I go to a coffee shop here and I take out my knitting or I, I sometimes knit on the train. And when you have, I had once an elderly lady sitting next to me and she was kind of, you could see, she was kind of looking, what's he doing there? And she was that, oh, he, he really can knit. Oh, what's, what's he knitting there? But she was a little bit too shy maybe to ask, but then she couldn't hold it anymore. She's like, ah, what are you knitting? <laughs> it's really cute. And of course, the other day I was, I was riding to a beautiful little town and I went to uh, have some lunch. And I carry knitting with me. And one of my students, she made me little project bags. And I didn't pay much attention which bag I'm taking. And it was a pink one. <laughs> but my whole outfit is black. Right. And for, for Japan, I'm still quite tall. So I was there in my complete black outfit with a black helmet and motorbike boots carrying a pink little bag with me <laughs> and one lady on the road she was kind of looking at me said, what are you wearing what are you carrying there in your pink bag I said oh yeah it's pink because I have a black one too but I didn't really pay any attention and it was a very nice way actually to get to know each other so we started to talk and I told her that I'm knitting and she said, oh you're knitting she took me to a kimono maker then she said, oh, I know a really great kimono maker. She, this guy made amazing kimonos, I know, weaving oh. and dye, awesome. So it was actually, it's a really, really nice way of meeting people and getting to know them. I quite enjoy that. Well, do you think like the Japanese culture sort of influences what you need or how you need? I don't, I mean, the, the way of knitting, of course, is fixed, but my perception of color, of course, I very much enjoy Japanese color palettes and the nature here in Japan has some very, very unique color combinations. When you go out and you see uh, camellias and they flower in December here and you have this beautiful pink large flower against the dark green foliage, that's absolutely a beautiful color combination. I don't know if we had something like this in Germany and you have uh, citrus trees here, orange trees and uh, uh, mandarin trees. You have the orange against that. So the, the color palettes in Japan are very, very beautiful. And historic color palettes, I have several books on that. Awesome. Very, very nice. And the, the weaving culture here in Japan for kimonos, silk, materials, I mean, it's endless what I can learn from here to be honest. Yes, I would say it very, very much. I mean, here, Indigo, um, it does influence me very much on what I'm doing. What uh, comes to mind when somebody asks you, like, what's your comfort food? Is it German cuisine? Is it Japanese cuisine? Like, what do you immediate, like, first thing that pops to mind? <laughs> that comes to mind, of course, you live in Japan, sushi. <laughs> sushi is very yummy. To be very honest, my most favorite food, and all the Japanese even they laugh about it, are dried persimmon fruits. I don't know if you know kaki. Yeah. And I once visited a beautiful little island in Japan here. It's called Sado Island. It's the sixth largest island of Japan, and it's very charming. I can highly recommend everybody to go there. And in winter, they're drying these orange fruits. And I had never seen them before. And I saw all outside the houses, there were all these beautiful orange lines of the fruits. And I asked my, uh, the, the lady from the guest house, the Ryokan, what is that? I, I thought it's onions, but they, they didn't really look. And she said, oh, no, no, it's kaki. It's persimmon. And I said, what, what is that? I never tried it. And she gave, and I love it. And luckily, Gifu is one of the centers for producing kaki. They are absolutely fantastic. And they are right in front of my doorstep. So whenever people ask you, what's your favorite food in Japan? I said, kaki. And everybody, <laughs> or even the Japanese, they say, what? But they're really yummy. Try. You can, buy, you can probably buy kaki around. You need to peel them, okay. put them on a string, and let them dry. And the best is when they're 
slightly when they're half dried. Oh, it's absolutely <laughs> delicious. Very nice. And it's magic because the fruit itself is quite bitter or sour, but when you dry it, it turns sweet. Right. And that's what I enjoy. This the magic of nature. It turns something, you know, or when you have like a yarn like this, you do something with it, very simple, and it changes. It has this magic. That's really nice. So when you started teaching knitting, yeah. how how do you see yourself change from like that first class on knitting to what you teach today? Like how did you change as an instructor? Well, first of all, I, I learned more what people really would like to knit. And first, when I started, I probably also, my Japanese was not really, I didn't know all the, the words and how to say that and how to explain that. And I knew my way of knitting, but in Japan, some things are a little bit, uh, not different, but more detailed or people wanted to have more information or, for example, the charts. I've really had no idea how detailed the charts had to be to really show that to the people. And in most classes here in Japan, you probably have a curriculum, but I thought everybody's a little bit different. So how can I, how can I make a curriculum that really suits everybody? So, okay, let's make no curriculum and everybody can knit the things they want. And that was quite good, to be honest. I found that very, very interesting. So now I just know much more about how Japanese people like to knit and how much detailed information they need and what colors they like and what kind of interesting patterns they enjoy. So yeah, I'm, I, I hope I'm better now than when I first started. <laughs> well, I mean, do you, like, I feel like you talk a lot about patterns and how Japanese people like to follow the patterns. Yeah. Do you feel like it's your role of, as an instructor to sort of push them outside of their comfort zone and experiment with the designs and experiment with like changes? Yeah, I, I really enjoy that. The, what, what works very well here in Japan, Japanese people are extremely good in following instructions and once they understand it, they can, of course, they can change. And But first, they probably want to make exactly the same. So for example, this sweater, I cannot repeat it because right. the, the yarn would be different. So in many cases, they really like to make the same. And because the history of knitting is not very long in Japan, a lot of things are just not known. For example, the short row knitting, it's, it was done in, in, in a very different way, which I found a little bit more complicated than actually it, it should be. And it was not really used to create shapes and patterns. It was just used, for example, to create, uh, uh, when you make a sweater to, to make the shoulder, you know, to put in darts or something, but it was not really used as a knitting technique. I just would love to show people more how, how big this, the world of knitting actually is to, to broaden their horizon a little bit and to show them just how much fun it can be and how many beautiful colors you can have and new techniques like brioche knitting. Of course, in Japan, brioche knitting is known, but not as deep as maybe in other uh, countries. Right. And to show them the fun of that, I, I feel is kind of what I really would like to do to show them and to help them then to make their own. Do you ever look back and ask yourself, like, what was I thinking, not continuing my engineering career? Do you ever like regret it? Was there like one day when you? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. I, I mean, I must say, I, I feel I'm very lucky and I'm blessed that I can do what I do right now. I don't think many people maybe have the same chance. I was lucky because, I mean, I live alone. So if I had a family, I probably, probably would have thought twice about it because once you have a family, you have to provide. But as I'm alone, I, don't, I only have to look after myself. And I think I was just very, very lucky. And I had a lot of very nice people helping me. So I don't know if I could do the same in Germany, for example. Here in Japan, a man who knits 
is still something very unique, which gives me a lot of attention already. And because I can speak English, I know German, I can speak Japanese, I just have access to a lot more information than an average knitter here probably would have. So that puts me in a very unique position. And I just love to share it with the people. And no, I would never go back. I, do, I think when, when I worked here in Japan, I had a lot of neckties because you always had to wear a necktie. I think I have one or two left. <laughs> I don't <laughs> own any. I don't even own a suit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would need to completely refill my wardrobe with different clothes if I had to go back to an office. Right. No way. Well, and, what's your personal yarn stash looks like and how easy it is to find good yarn in Japan? When I first came here, you, you have some very large stores in Tokyo. In the countryside, it's a little bit different. You have some very good makers here in Japan. Um, some very strong brands. I make some of my own yarn also with a company here in, in Gifu together. Um, there's a family called Yanagi and they have their own company. They're selling handicraft items and together we produce some yarns. Very close to me actually lives uh, Mr. Noro. <laughs> The, the Noro yarn is very close. It's actually 16 kilometers away from where I'm living. So to get good yarn is not difficult in Japan. I don't have a lot of yarn at the moment. I look for very particular yarn. And right now I'm, I'm trying to do other things. I have a lot of cotton at the moment, which I want to use. Um, I dye some yarn of myself. And I have very nice connections with, uh, with Germany, with Schoppel. They always sent me very nice yarn, which I enjoy to use also for my books. There's some very good Japanese makers and there are some very good dyer because Gifu and the area around here historically is very much known for weaving and fabric making. So they have a lot of extremely good dyer. And someday there is one dyer, they have some an open house with some of their yarns. And actually this yarn is from them, this yarn. I found during a company tour through their uh, company and it was kind of in a box and I took it out and I said, oh my God, this is beautiful. And I just said, sorry guys, but I must have that. And Sunday I will take the sweater. They haven't seen it yet. And I want to show it to them because the dyer usually don't know what it will look like once you knit it. Okay. So getting yarn in Japan is really not that difficult and you can import a lot now also so all the major foreign brands are here too well, what would get your attention like when you see like you in the store it's a huge store and they have every kind of yarn what you would gravitate towards like what catches your attention it's probably the color probably color is I, I enjoy strong colors vivid colors next would probably be something unique some unique color patterns or something. Oh, then depending what I want to knit. Right now, I'm also very interested in using uh, yarn for textile making, very thin yarn to, to blend it together into my own little, here, this, this thing I knitted with that. And I knitted that with eight, with eight little, very, very Friends. thin, it's an OEM yarn. And uh, then ply by ply, I changed the colors. Okay. And that's something I'm very interested in right now to make something like this. And this it is has like, this. I'm, I'm fascinated with this particular design. Like, uh, <laughs> it's cool, isn't it? It's very cool. Isn't it cool? I knitted several actually of these. It's a very old pattern. And I made some changes and then I started to arrange it in different. And this is the first time I knitted it in such a gradation. And I just love it. I, I really enjoyed this. And that was the first pattern actually I made a chart for because I found the pattern somewhere and it was all written instructions. 
And I thought, ah, how can I show that to my students at my knitting class? And I thought, okay, I need to knit it. And then I chart it. So I was just knitting each row and made a chart. And then I took it to the class and people went absolutely nuts about it. So <laughs> this is kind of a, a signature pattern for me. And I made all sorts of different items from that. I made a lamp, I made hats, I made gloves, I made socks. I made it into a picture and all sorts, always this pattern. And well, let, it, let me ask you about, um, you mentioned that you're not on Ravelry. No. Like, like why not? Like you speak English, it's probably easy enough for you to translate those patterns into English and publish them in English and German, and that would open all new market. Like, are you just very satisfied with where you are? Do you see oh. doing it in the future? Actually, I, I would love to, to make some uh, books in English. That, that would be something I'd uh, be very interested in, or to have some of my books translated into English. The, the charts in Japan are very much Japanese. To translate that so that, for example, an American Nita could read it, I would need to make complete different changes. And I don't know how to do that, to be honest. <laughs> it's more like a technical issue. And I just want to spend my time knitting, to be honest. To make charts, it's very time consuming. You need to knit the piece again. You, it, it takes a lot of time. and. At the end of the day, does it really pay for it? Uh, I don't know. I love to show my stuff and I just want to spend my time knitting. Well, we talked a little bit before we started this interview about artistic freedom versus yeah, yeah. what sells, what you need to, the schedule of design and the pressure of putting out patterns. Do you find yourself being pressed about it? Do you find yourself like compromising your artistic freedom in order to publish next book and next book and next pattern and next chart? Like, do you ever find yourself frustrated and just want to let your mind wander? No, not really. I mean, the books I made, I always enjoyed. And it was always something I felt very strong about. For example, the, the glove I invented was a, is a really unique piece and it was fun to make the book. Of course, you have a deadline and you have to make pieces and it takes a lot of time. And I have a lot of ideas I would like to knit, but time-wise you can't do that all the time. When I started knitting, I always thought, I want to just knit. And then if people enjoy that and they want to make it, great. If they don't, okay, but I like it. I want to do the things I like to make. Right. and when I first started, of course, you need to make money. Now I'm, I'm a little bit more comfortable in what I'm doing. And because my books are selling very well, one has actually been published now at eighth time or ninth time. So they're, they're really, I mean, even the publishers are surprised <laughs> how, how good they're selling. So the books are doing well. And I bought a, a small house. So where I am, this is my own house. So I don't need to pay rent. So my, my fixed costs are, are rather low. And uh, that puts me in the position to have some freedom to really enjoy and do what I want to do. Of course, I have to make money and I have to pay my taxes and I have to pay for my motorbike. But uh, I do want to make the things I really like to do. And then if people like it, great. If not, can't help it. If I, if I just have to make something for other people, I don't know if that would be the right way for me. I usually knit for myself and then show it to the people. And some, some people, they say, oh, it's not what I want to do. Oh, that's okay. Because I have different uh, objectives sometimes when I need something. Yeah? For this sweater, for example, I wanted to use the yarn. Somebody else probably says, well, it's not what I want to do. That's okay. I mean, knitting is so versatile and so interesting. Everybody can make what they want to do. And uh, luckily, usually the, the people find the stuff I'm making very interesting. And, well, uh, how many things do you work on at the same time? Like, are you a one project guy or do you have like 17 different projects at the same time on your needles? Not 17, but probably six or seven all at the same time. I usually have some lace piece because I like lace knitting. And then I have something I can take with me on motorbike trips. Then I work on another book. So I have to knit sometimes on pieces like that. Now I'm knitting on another sweater because I like to make some summer items. 
I started a cardigan, but that's for autumn. So I thought, oh, I wait until autumn because it's getting warm here now in Japan. And uh, I have another cardigan, which I'm crocheting at the moment. I need to make the sleeves, which I haven't really done yet because I have something else I want to make. Uh, now I get into like mosaic knitting. I find now very interesting. I want to make some some uh, charts for that and experiment with that. And I just ordered some more thin yarn in cotton because I want to make a gradation sweater for myself. And then I have another idea for a sweater knitted sideways. I want to try that too. So idea wise, I could have eight pants and probably another set of legs with that too to be honest <laughs> well, are there like ever a day when you out of ideas like are there ever oh. days when you're not knitting i no i think i'm knitting probably every single day i and unless i really th there is something that prohibits me from knitting because i have maybe have meetings or classes but there is not one day where I'm not knitting. I knit all the time and I always have ideas. And sometimes I, I work on it and I thought oh, it's maybe not so interesting and I let it go. It's really, for me, knitting is like a problem solving. It's mind over matter. How can I make something out of one thread of yarn, just using two needles? How can I, I tweak it? and I like the, the yarn to, I'm more like a tour guide for the yarn. I don't want to force it into a, a structure. I like the, the yarn to take on and just have the freedom to expand the way they want and let, let, let the piece and the, the design shape it. Sometimes when I start knitting something, I don't know what it will look like in the end. I mean, I are you ever disappointed with what you're making? Are you ever like getting to the end and you're like, well, that's not really working or that's not how I pictured it? Yeah, I had I had some pieces, not many, but some pieces that, oh, yeah, maybe could do it better. I had one sweater I worked on and thought, oh, it's too simple. Um, do I want to spend time on that? Or when I, when I knitted this sweater, I started first with the yarn and I made a shawl. And then I thought, mm, but well, I'm not using it. So is it really something I want to, to continue? And then I had the idea for the sweater. So, oh, that's much better. I pretty much know if I don't continue on a piece regularly, then I know by gut's feeling, it's not a good design. If, if I'm really excited about something and it's, I work on it really endless, then I know good design, it works. Like this sweater I finished in a few days because I was very excited how, how the yarn turned out or the other sweater was also like uh, just a couple of weeks and it was finished. But some designs, I know if they're lying there for a few days, then I know mm, maybe not a good idea. <laughs> well, you mentioned your friend, the carpenter and how that was inspiring for you. And that gave you a thought of like, why not try it myself? Yeah. Like if somebody who is just, dabbling in design now or who is considering it as a career would come to you and ask for advice like what would be your advice to new people to like starting designers i i think i mean for for myself of course you have to when i started on that my idea was since i was living in japan i always worked to make money and my idea was, I thought, is that really what I want to do? If I, is it just to have a job to have money? I, I, why do I live in Japan? Why do I do that in Japan? And I thought myself, okay, let's reverse it. Let's do what you really enjoy doing and see if you can make money from that. For, forget about the money. For myself, it worked out. If you have a family you have to provide for, knitting is a very slow industry making pieces is is very slow making money from that is not always easy <clears throat> but at the end of the day if you don't try you don't know and if you have if you have a passion for that if you really really enjoy that i think you can you can do you need to find your unique way in japan there is this term ikigai find what you love 
uh, if you can make money from that, th this, this kind of concept surrounds that. But I would say really you need to think about it very strongly. Um, the different tools now, I don't know if I would anybody recommend doing it, to be honest. For myself, it worked out. In your own country, can I do the same in Germany? I don't know, because here in Japan, I'm, I have a lot of attention because just because I'm a foreigner, right. but I, for myself, I would always do it again. I, I would do, and I, as long as I can, I want to continue knitting. Like my carpenter friend, he's 85 and he loves what he does. He goes to his little workshop every day. He's not rich and his workshop is so cluttered. He has hardly a place to stand. He makes the most awesome things and he has no regrets and he has a very happy life. And for myself, I think as long as I can do it physically, if I'm uh, healthy enough, um, I don't want to retire. If I were to retire, I would continue knitting right away. So just if you just want to do it to make money, I think it's too difficult, to be honest, because the, there's a lot of competition. There are a lot of other people doing it. For me, it was the opposite. I didn't do it to make money. I, I wanted to see if I can knit and then make money from that. So money was not the first objective. Whatever sparks joy in your life. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And of course, if you have a if you have a hobby and you want to make your hobby your work, it sometimes it spoils the hobby. So I'm really in a very unique kind of situation. I never really had planned to become a knitting instructor in Japan, but uh, I was lucky enough that uh, I succeeded with that. Hopefully I can continue to do that. And the, the media attention of course helps, uh, bookmaking helped, I do classes, I do Zoom classes. Like now we can do this on Zoom, I do Zoom workshops. I know some people in Germany that would love to do Zoom workshops with me. Now the technology is different. We can do things we couldn't do 10 years ago. Right. Well, so, I hope I hope you can see the translating your books into English or maybe I hope publishing so. them on Ravelry because I would love to need one of your designs. Honestly, I, I mean, I don't want to, to praise myself, but I have some very unique pieces I would love to share. And I know some, uh, the, the uh, shopper, they have a page under my name somewhere and they, they show some of my designs and some of my designs are published in their book. I don't know if they're translated into English. I would love to find a publisher in England, in America, could be Australia, who wants to take on translating the books and show some of my designs to a broader audience. There's some very unique pieces and they're not difficult. I always say, good knitting does not need to be difficult. And I try to follow very simple rules. So once you understand the concept, you don't need a chart to continue them anymore. I, I try to make it simple because here in Japan, the, the charts are so complicated to make, I need to make it quite simple so we can actually make it into a book. Right. And that's why I usually follow a very, very systematic concept which then leads to making my shorts or my, my hats or snoots or whatever. They're not complicated. The German, the German publisher uh, Stiebner, they found my Japanese books on Amazon. And then they contacted me because they have capabilities to translate from Japanese to German. So that was also very lucky. If any of the American publishers are watching this interview. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> just, you know, it's not difficult to translate. Most books, they don't have a lot of words and it's always the same. Right. I just don't know if the Japanese charts would work, for example, for an American knitter. They're very easy to read, but I know in America you have everything uh, written out, right. which if I had to do that, I would probably <laughs> need a lot of time to do that. 
Yeah, it's funny because like I often talk about like I, I need a lot of lace. So I'm a chart girl. Like I prefer charts to written instructions. Actually, written yes. instructions confuse me more than anything. Um, yeah, me too. Oftentimes people would ask like are there written instructions for this chart? And I was yeah. trying to explain that it's the same like in musical notation. If you yeah. know how to read those eight notes, you're good basically. You can play yes. any piece, right? It's just a matter of practice. Yes. Same thing with like reading charts. Like once you know those neat pearl, neat two together, yarn over, you exactly. go to basically. You know, you can meet anything. Yeah, that that's true. I I find first when I when I started out making charts, it was really quite difficult, and I had to to learn it and think about it. And but I usually use just a very simple spreadsheet, and I have a font which makes a knitting. Uh, symbols right. and with that I can pretty much make any chart I need and for all my books I made the charts that the publisher then made them into their own system but I first have to make the chart myself and I have some uh, knitting sets which I sell online and I have the the written instructions for that and uh, they're all in a Japanese way and I must say once you know how to do the charts and how to read them they're absolutely superb. And I get a lot of good comments from knitters in Germany. They always say, wow, your, your instructions are really good. Your charts are really, really good. And they really enjoy that. And they're all the, made the way they're done here in Japan. And that's something they have really figured out well. And all the publishers use the same symbols. So whatever book you read, you have the same charts well i and love your designs i love looking on instagram and seeing your pictures and <laughs> i love your sense of colors and your adventurous you. spirit when it comes to knitting so i'm glad we had the chance to chat and get to know each other a little bit yeah thank you very much that was a lot of fun thank you for and, being uh, my just guest keep it up. thank you thanks for having me you take care you too thank you